Hello, my name is Robert Arellano. Some of you know me as Bobby. I'm a professor of creative arts at Southern Oregon University, and I am delighted to present the Screening Cuba Talkback for Ashland Independent Film Festival. This was a very special talkback that uh, combines three different creative teams. Steve Fagan, uh, whose work Batiste Syndrome uh, we're screening at the festival, um, Miguel Coyula, and Lynn Cruz, uh, whose uh, film Nadie is screening at the festival, and then a uh, creative pair uh, known as Nelson Ramirez de Ariano Conde and Lyudmila Velasco, who go by Lyudmila and Nelson, and their video art piece um, is at the Schneider Museum. It's called Hotel Havana. I spoke with each of those three in that order, uh, and uh, here's how it went. Uh, Steve Fagan, totally smooth. And he was uh, the first one because he's in New York, so we were able to jump on Zoom. And special thanks to coordinator of hospitality for the festival, Chloe, for making that go so smoothly. Uh, next up, Chloe and I tried to Zoom with Havana to talk to Miguel and Lynn, and we learned that just that week, uh, Zoom had uh, banned Havana from using their platform. So we were scrambling for something to do. Uh, you'll notice uh, uh, it's not bad quality, but it's an odd quality of uh, interview we were able to do with them using a messenger called WhatsApp, uh, which only captured the video and then separately holding up a phone to get the audio. At that point, we realized we... Um, would probably do best with uh, Ludmilla and Nelson to just let them uh, pre-record some questions that we prepared for them and respond and send us the video file. So that's why you'll see theirs is a little shorter, but also more to the point, fewer interruptions from Professor Ariano. Uh, I just really wanna thank Richard Herskowitz and the Ashland Independent Film Festival for giving me this terrific opportunity for what I think is gonna be a fantastic program. And I hope the beginning of many collaborations between Ashland Independent Film Festival, Schneider Museum of Art, and Cuba, Havana, and people working outside of Cuba on Cuba-themed media for years to come. So thank you to the audiences, and I hope you enjoy this very special talk back, Screening Cuba. <laughs> Que por mi bien cantes mucho Al recibir los despojos De la que fue mis amores Y en el lugar que reposa Fagan, thank you so much for talking back with us a little bit on the Batista Syndrome, just an extraordinary series and uh, a work of art and a work of history. And I'd love it if you could tell us a little more about the origins of Batista Syndrome, you and your producer partner, Berta Jotar. How'd you come up with the concept or the plan for this ambitious project? Uh, well, actually, I, the original idea was to make a, a film of... Uh, of uh, Leonardo uh, Padura's uh, The Man Who Loved Dogs, which is this 
extraordinary history of the entire 20th century that overlays the story of Trotsky with the assassin of Trotsky who spent the last years of his life in Havana. And actually we really got very fair along and Pedora was very supportive. I gave him a script, his literary agent in Spain was on board, but at the same time, there was an offer from a Hollywood company. And Pedora still encouraged us saying, well, we'll try to include you in the package, showing that you're both very important and you're irrelevant <laughs> to their commercial enterprise. Uh, I, having some experience with Los Angeles, knew that one thing is like a cancer cell and there would be no Los Angeles lawyer that would allow my piece to be made. So I had funding for a, a Cuba project. And I decided to switch over to some variation, a uh, very uh, eclectic mutant variation of something based on Kabir Infante's Three Trap Tigers, because I really did want to try to uh, overlay something with the literary text. That was, uh, and so that one was the surrogate and the piece sort of uh, developed very rapidly. I, I mean, I sort of had to, read up on the topic uh, and like hundreds of books I read. And basically then we I did several trips to Cuba where uh, Berta arranged a series of interviews with people. And I really originally didn't want any interviews in it because I'm very subject, uh, very critical of the idea of testimony because testimony functions not the way it does in court where there's cross-examination and perjury and other evidence and people just could say what they want and because they're speaking it, it seems like the truth. And that was when I saw this uh, film of Goebbels' secretary, this 105 year old woman, her face in close up all wrinkled and those wrinkles must tell the truth. I don't think so. So <laughs> this idea of storytelling uh, started with the testimony but then the testimony, the people were so entertaining. Actually, then I redid things with them, actually having them focus on a, a segment of the interview and actually having them slightly theatricalize what they originally said. So even those are sort of uh, uh, staged, uh, but every single section in the piece, all eight sections, all two hours and 20 minutes are all based on original factual material. And the point is to take that material and show that stories could be entered from any point of view and you never know where it will begin. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, you know, it occurs to me in a time when uh, there's so much media out there that's purporting to be true or reality or unscripted television, you sort of flip that formula on its head and ask people who would otherwise want to just try to tell their, their heads, talking heads story directly to the camera, you ask them to insert some drama and to stage things. Is that, um, is that based in any movement in the last half century or so, whether postmodernism or? Oh, I, I, I actually, I did, I did a, a piece in the past called The Machine That Killed Bad People that was actually about TV and revolution. And it was probably the only moment of light bulb moment I ever had. It was in 1986 and this event is going on in the Philippines and it's on TV. And it's very clear to me that this is a TV event made for TV. And, uh, and then from then you had from China to Ceausescu happening the same time. So I staged an entire TV network simulating CNN, but telling very different types of stories, uh, like Amelda Marcos's dreams, uh, things like that. So I, I and I thought I could sort of structure that in a way that would be uh, grammatically correct, but semantically perverse. So the things told are are very different, but the order of things is exactly according to CNN. So this I and so I, I I've always been interested in. Uh, uh, in, in, in this relationship. And I moved, I moved away from originally doing interviews to forcing people to stage. And when I did the previous piece in Cuba, uh, Tropicola, I worked with actors, very, very good actors, uh, very famous Cuban actors, and had them actually uh, uh, pretend to be live people, you know, and, and, and improvise. And so I thought I was gonna get more of this texture of reality from using these actors than yeah. using the actual people. And, and, and what I wanted was a truth, not a fact. And so I thought there was a truth that emerged 
through this uh, eclectic formatting uh, rather than worrying about some uh, court-based judicial process that is not really relevant to the cinema anyway. Ah, fascinating, Steve. Now, so Batista syndrome is a real syndrome. Is Dr. Daniel Santos in the film an actual? Well, he's, he's a, a, a very famous Cuban actor. And uh, one, I did want to combine not only the Cabrera Infante, but the Oliver Sacks, uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. And so he is a, a, a neurologist and, and he sort of uh, uh, tells these stories uh, about how people uh, have this sort of very eccentric relation to what's in front of them. And in fact, uh, two of the stories told in it, because uh, this relation to uh, Cabrera Infante is on many levels, are actually about Cabrera Infante. The opening story, about the person that uh, was forgetting about the things that happened in Havana and his wife bought him a map so he could write, uh, once he saw the places, he could write a story about what happened in the place. That's actually a story of Cabrera Infante after he had a nervous breakdown and went through shock therapy in London. That's, you know, that's a story that's told, I think her, Miriam Gomez uh, uh, was his wife and, I, and that's based on a story she tells. Incredible. I had not, I had no idea about that. And so I sort of used that as one of the, it's one of the motifs, this narration. And in fact, the first story he tells in, in the uh, cemetery uh, about memory is pretty much a Rosetta Stone for the entire piece. Oh, uh, perfect, chills. Well, great. So we have Cabrera Infante, a great novel, Three Trapped Tigers. We have the man who mistook his wife for a hat, Oliver Sacks. Um, and then we have this Batista syndrome. Um, I'd like to do, if we could, zoom in on one sequence, the final sequence. We do have um, an episode with uh, the actor playing Dr. Daniel Santos there. We have a Cuban rumba, but help me like really zoom in on this scene. What are we looking at in the opening? Uh, we see the title, March 13th, 1957. We have a singer in the style of Celia Cruz. And we also hear someone uh, giving us a radio report, like from Radio Reloj, the famous clock radio. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a national holiday in Cuba, it's March 13, 1957. And this was the, uh, the piece very much focuses more on the resistance in Havana rather than the what's going on in the Sierra. And, and basically, I think, for instance, in 1957, 3,000 uh, resistance fighters died in Havana and 15 people died in the Sierra. So the blood of what's going on in the resistance is, is uh, not to denigrate what's going on in the Sierra, but there's a hell of a lot going on in Havana. And the movement, the student movement, uh, which had an alliance with the uh, July 26th uh, movement, Castro's uh, movement, they believed in a different way of change. They believed in chopping the head off. They had assassinated the head of the secret police for uh, Batista in 1956 at the Montmartre Hotel. Actually, that's actually dealt with in uh, episode two, actually talks about that. And, and, and then they staged this event, which again was like a performance piece. They staged two things. They staged that storming of the Batista's palace to assassinate Batista. And at the same time, they staged the siege of the radio station to take it over and acknowledge, say that they've assassinated Batista and that people should come to the streets and there should be a public insurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the palace thing was a dud, the radio thing kind of half happened. Uh, what you see in the 57 uh, March 13 section is the uh, statements that are actually made from the radio. And, and those are, there is actually those radio recordings and the, uh, uh, the, the young actress, uh, Grisella, uh, she actually, when I sort of played that for the uh, uh, actors before in the, in the rehearsals, she knew it by heart already from school. She knew what was said. So she, and, and, so, the oh. thing, and so, so I go through this thing where they overturned the radio station and there's a very lovely section in Cabrera Infante, who's often the inspiration uh, uh, the section in his book where he deals with the assassination of Trotsky told by nine Cuban writers in the style. 
And so I thought to do this event, risking a blasphemy, this very important event in Cuban history, a martyrdom actually, uh, in the style of three Cuban singers. Uh, and since it was on the radio, what was going on, the visualization was perfectly <laughs> up to yeah. me. Uh, and, and so I do it in this very, very uh, eclectic style, ending uh, in a sort of very eulogistic uh, style, which, which that section on the staircase, uh, we shot almost 94.3% of the piece in the Cinema Rex complex. And when I came in there, I saw they had the stairwell. So I knew I had to write something for the stairwell. And I staged it uh, in the style of a, a Greek tragedy, meaning on three levels, the chorus on the bottom, the major performer in the middle and the gods on top. And as in a Greek tragedy, the actual murder does not occur on stage. Oh, yes. And, 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 and I, I feel very happy with that section. And, and I, uh, as I, overall, I felt tremendously happy with the production team that produced the space for me, Berto yeah. Hotar organizing, the wonderful, wonderful, actors and if people want to see uh two of the act uh, all all three of the actors uh, two of them two of them uh the singer and the uh girl that both plays the bug and she plays also the uh, uh revolutionary uh the uh their auditions are on a youtube channel actually of the piece and so people could see that they could all see to see in my mind an extremely um, gratifying panel that was done in Havana on the piece. Yeah. Uh, and I was very, very happy with the reception of the uh, panelists, uh, including uh, Victor Fowler Calzado and Roberto Zurbano. And uh, I was just delighted with their enthusiasm for the piece and the audience's real interest in, in willing to really have this long, proper, intense discussion about it. And that That's was really YouTube. and also you've got a really robust uh, a collection of resources, I think, including links to some of those YouTube videos on the website Syndrome Batista, the title, but just with the words flip.com. Yeah, the, uh, the website. And then there's also a YouTube channel. The Facebook page all sounds very good. I was basically a flop on Instagram. <laughs> First of all, I don't like Instagram, but I, there was no excuse how, how much I flopped on Instagram. <laughs> we had probably minus, 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 uh, minus uh, followers. <laughs> it did not go viral on Instagram. I watched that rehearsal, or rather the um, um, screen test for your actor who plays um, both the bug. And yeah. Uh, and incredible energy, just you, you feel chills knowing how uh, serious Cubans are about their art. I mean, here was a person who just like did, I think as you say in, the, um, in your first response to uh, her screen test, clearly this is someone who will do whatever it takes to get the <laughs> art across. Yeah, um, I took it very literally, and, and, and it's a general way I work with performers because I work in a very shorthand manner. I only work with them. I mean, the whole, everything in Cinema Rex was shot in seven days, the entire part in Cinema Rex, and the entire piece was shot over 10 days. So basically what I do is when I do the audition, I kind of see what the actors could do well themselves, and then I write the script over the actor rather than having them try out to be, you know, Scarlett O'Hara or something like that. So, uh, and uh, Batiza Bismarck, who's the Afro-Cuban girl in it, she actually uh, tried out for it and I didn't have a part for her, uh, but she was so good that I had to make a part. And, yeah. uh, and so they, when we were doing the, uh, uh, what was going to be shot, what days. I had to make up days that, and I never knew what I was going to do with her. But, and so she, in fact, is the one person that actually has the most improvisational uh, luxury in the piece. And when she, she, one of the characters she plays is a, uh, a rich girl in Cuba. And it was a question I had. I had, shot, I had worked on a project that, uh, fact, this wonderful, wonderful performance space in Havana. I think it's like surely the best place in the Americas. And I, there was all these like 
you know, beautiful people in short skirts and nice outfits. I say, where do these people get all this money? So I said to her, like, how does a Cuban, like, if you, like you, how would you get rich? <laughs> and so she came up, she came up with the story, how she could get rich. And then I told her, I want you to say that you hate going to, to, to fat. She says, no problem. I could do that. And then <laughs> she always walked around with this bag from Paris and then she, you know, she, and so everything was kind of adapted to hanging out with her. Cause also we had to bring, usually when you're doing a production, you bring the crew people first, they work for three or four hours. Then you bring the actors, you keep the actors away from sitting around doing nothing because of the nature of Havana. And it's so difficult for the performers to count on being able to get there. Uh, the bus might not come, uh, they live so scattered we had to pick everybody up first thing in the morning. So the actors would, would have to sit around like for three and a half hours doing nothing. So I spent a lot of time <laughs> writing Batista's character, sitting with her and going back and forth and says, I know you're going to include that. You know, so, and often the actors and other people found things in the script that they had told me in these interim periods. So great to hear about your process like that, Steve. It's truly a testament not only to the uh, very in, um, interactive, collaborative, dynamic approach you take to your art, but for, for the reason we have an independent film festival like this one in Ashland. You just don't find production uh, values like yours in uh, these, as you mentioned earlier, these Hollywood scripts with the lawyers who need to have everything um, set in advance. And it's just so exciting that uh, you're making this kind of work and the, the audiences here at the Ashland Independent Film Festival uh, can see it programmed in even in a remote or virtual uh, edition this year, but in such, I think, uh, the rights context like it needs to be in. And we know we can go to your website for more, but would you, for the audiences here who want to learn more, are there any um, uh, press or uh, other? Uh, there's a couple of things. I, I think there's a, a very uh, a wonderful article uh, written by Susana Rodriguez Drisse that appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books. And uh, often uh, it was a, a friend of mine connected me with her because she's a, a novelist and a poet and uh, a theater director and she's Cuban. And she just adored the piece. And the only nudge I gave her was I told her about Oliver Sacks and Cabrera Infante and then I never saw the piece until she sent me the day before and it's it, I think it's extraordinary piece because it emphasizes uh, very strongly the issues around this idea of how uh, which I say a, a more cultural memory as opposed to individual memory and history is constructed and how it's very important to understand it's not about learning about the present it's not about uh, not making the same mistakes. We live and make our actions the based on our own, not only our personal experience in terms of like what we did on Tuesday and what we did as a child, but our idea of what's possible in the world. And that's based on our embodiment of a history. And so what I wanted very strongly to do was take the uh, very frozen stories of Cuban history, the story of the Sierra, the story of the lost city told in Miami, and the story of Meyer Lansky told in New York, and kind of break them apart and really see how and open up the possibility of reshuffling these things uh, and allowing entry from extraordinarily surprising points of view, which means to imply it could come from anywhere. Beautiful. That's really what you've done. And I I know this article you're referring to, it uh, really captures a uh, very sophisticated understanding of this process perfectly. LA Review of Books, Batista Syndrome, it's the first thing that comes up, but it's yeah. Susana Rodriguez Drisi, D-R-I-S-S-I. -S -S great, and, great and thing. She, and she's, uh, she's also a good novelist, and I recommend her recent novel. Excellent. I, I only know her through two emails. I'd never met her or anything. Well, well, we'll know how to find and read more. We're just following your work and very, very- uh, I'd, like, I'd like just to say the two things before, Please. to be sure that the extraordinary comp, uh, uh, participation of the producer, Berta Hotar, who worked with the piece uh, before it began and after it ended and never quit and organized this amazing cluster of people 
and these people that were brought into the piece, the stupendous level of talent available in Cuba. It oh. is humbling, humbling, and humbling, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, how talented people are. Yes. And, and how generous they through. were to me. How generous they were. It shows through in your project. You were truly blessed. I feel like you had a... Uh a guardian sort of padrino of some kind because Cuba embraces you, Steve, uh, and Berta, who I know lives half the year in Cuba. Yeah, her, her father, her father who's passed is Cuban. And so she's, uh, she's a very interesting, eclectic uh, person. She's combination, uh, she, her mother's side of the family is Lebanese Mexican uh, and her father's side of the family is Cuban. Excellent. So she's a very strong-minded, <laughs> vivacious person <laughs> we told we hope to welcome you here in person someday but for now virtually thank you for joining us este es tu casa the ashland independent film festival and viva syndrome batista <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>
those four hours, he told me the story of the prostitute, which is in the beginning of the film. And that was the start. Um, I edited that as a web series, as the first, first chapter was um, four or five minutes uh, episode web series, seven episodes at that time. At that time. And then uh, I said, well, uh, maybe I could do a feature film. And But that was the, the very beginning. I really, I just wanted to have a testimony, have him on camera, and um, didn't know I was going to make a film. But after that episode of The Prostitute is that I decided um, I could make a film and his relationship with the Cuban Revolution as the main subject. There are many people of Alcides um, generation that were involved in the revolution, and uh, but I don't think I know any, at least myself, I don't know anybody that will speak uh, with such honesty in front of a camera. There are some people that do it, but not in front of a camera. Mm. Uh, the fact that he grew disappointed that he's very honest and has, he has contradictions because uh, there's something a, a film teacher of mine said at the film school, and he said, "Never make a documentary film about a subject matter that you love or hate. <laughs> Otherwise, it becomes propaganda. Only make the film if there are enough contradictions in your main character." Mm. And, uh, he just embodied that, and uh, he was very honest. And that, that to me was also ter tremendously. Appealing. I can't help but want to understand how you would place yourself in the creative genres of the last 50 years, postmodernism. But would you say that you were influenced at all, either or both of you, by the um, Cine Imperfecto, both the directors and the, the actors? Um, yeah, it's interesting because uh, I grew up uh, watching films from all over the world. The cinematic is very close to where we live. So um, I saw films from the Soviet Union, Tarkovsky's films, uh, uh, Orson Welles films, Bertolucci, uh, David Lynch. So, and Japanese animation was, I think, my first film school even before I knew I wanted to make movies. So animation as well is, is a big influence. The films of Santiago Alvarez are, uh, now, I which I saw when I was a teenager, I really liked, and of course, Memories of Underdevelopment. So uh, I think that all those influences, uh, because Memories of Underdevelopment itself is a, uh, 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 it's a mix, it's a hybrid of many different styles of filmmaking that were happening in the world in the 60s. There's elements of Antonioni, there are elements of Jean-Luc Godard, of Italian neorealism, uh, uh, of the British free cinema. So it's a, it's a little bit of, a, of everything. And I think that's why Memories of Underdevelopment, it's, it's so striking because it combines all those different elements in one film. And I was a little struck by that. And in a way, the films I, I create also try to blend many different styles. In this case of Nadia, which is my first documentary, I, I was always refusing the idea of doing, um, like I said, a documentary about a talking head. But when you have someone like Alcides, I said it, it cannot be any other way because uh, in a way this is his testament. So instead of uh, taking the approach of cutting to illustrate, I wanted to leave him on camera as much time as possible and use the images behind him or in front of him in the form of animation or documentary footage, but never in a pure documentary still state. There's always some kind of manipulation in the image. Uh, uh, and uh, a film I made before that, Memories of Overdevelopment, which is based on a novel by Edmundo Esno, is the same author of Memories of Underdevelopment, the book, also has that element of imperfect cinema, because imperfect cinema was many times, uh, I think, misinterpreted as a way to make sloppy films in Cuba. And that's, uh, there are some great films, but there are some others that I think that, that fell in that time period, and they had to do it like that because it was what was fashionable, and they're not that great. But to me, imperfect cinema goes beyond um, even the, the definitions uh, by Julio Arce Espinosa. To me, imperfect cinema is uh, it, it's a way of rejecting not just the uh, mainstream, uh, let's say, Hollywood narrative or, or European mainstream art house. It's a, it's a way of, of combining, uh, really experimenting with the film language in the sense that I always say if you are going to be an independent filmmaker you have to be independent uh not in the sense that you finance the movie from your pocket, but you have to be independent in form and content. And, uh, and that translates to me to doing films that are ha 
I think independent cinema has to be uncomfortable. By definition, it has to question the, the reality that we live in. And it cannot be used to uh, reinforce... As a, many people go to see a movie as an audience to reinforce a vision that they already have on a subject matter. But not many of them go to have a debate with themselves or a dialogue with themselves or questioning themselves. And to me, that's... Um, the main goal, that's what I try to see when I go to see a movie, so that's what I try to do when I make a movie. Thank you. But it's interesting because in the moment when Alcides talks about beauty, he uh, he's uh, denying the images of uh, Marilyn Monroe, the appearance, no? Mm -hmm. So uh, in many, with many audience, uh, with, the, with Nadia, uh, there are many people work, uh, especially uh, women, uh, uh, asking about uh, this uh, moment when Narcissus also talks um, about me. Yes. And 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 I think uh, the the way that um, Narcissus describes the beauty and also Miguel in the um, film is um, with it. Um, he had he has these ideas of uh, the different way to approximarse to, to, approach, yeah. to, approach. to the beauty uh, with uh, uh, for example with the actress uh, Adela Legra, uh, that Alcide describes her face as uh, como se salvaje, wild, wild uh, and intense and it was because the revolution um, um, constructed an imagery um, based on that, starting exactly. with the Che Guevara picture, for example, they had that defiance in their eyes. Uh, basically, I was supposed to manufacture uh, beauty, let's say. And, and the, uh, filmmaker was, uh, the filmmakers uh, in the 60s years, uh, 1960s. 1960s years, they were denying the Hollywood uh, canon or uh, European, as Miguel was uh, saying. No? Absolutely. That was such a striking moment of the film, and and so honest, I thought, and uh, and also flattering. Y tu mujer, muy bonita. Yeah. For me, it was more than than the um, uh, external uh, uh, yeah. appearance. Mm -hmm. It's more about uh, what what you have in, inside. Yeah. And that is something interesting that happened in the film. At many points, I, I actually didn't talk much during the interviews because we would just go on for so long on the subject matters. And uh, something interesting at some points, he he starts talking mm -hmm. as if Fidel Castro is in front of him yes. and not me. Yes. And, and I thought that was fascinating because I think that for his generation, and also for my parents' generation, Fidel was talking to them on the television and they, sometimes they would talk back to him, but of course there was no communication. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in a way, it's a fantasy for many Cubans to be able to talk to Fidel and to demand answers for many things. So when he did that in the film, it occurred to me that, well, why don't I have him talk to, to Fidel himself? And then, so I listened to many of Fidel's speeches and constructed the dialogue so that they would have a conversation or a duel. Would you mind saying, what, what are we about to watch here, uh, this five-minute excerpt? Uh, well, the, this five minutes excerpt that we're going to watch now, it's a sort of making up of uh, Blue Heart, Corazon Azul, science fiction film. It's a film that was shot without permits, so um, I needed to use post-production on the computer to add all the elements I needed. Here in the cemetery, uh, what I did is I added a crematorium on the back, on the right, and some clouds and a vulture flying by. And in this shot, the spiral in the center starts moving clockwise very subtly, but as the shot progresses, you can see, even though it's more designed for the big screen, but you can see that it's moving. Now here there was a problem. I didn't like the wall on the left and the other building behind the main building, so I removed both of them and I added some structures that I filmed in a different neighborhood here on the foreground on the bottom. This is uh, another neighborhood, and what I did is I added the building on the left and the car with the mirror at the bottom left. Uh, this is the building just the way it was, and then I added the structures from the other neighborhood on the bottom and some vultures flying on the top, which were there, but they didn't fly at that specific time. This is the wall of the building, and uh, this is a still picture I took in an abandoned factory. 
And what I did is I added the picture onto the wall of the building. Here, after I shot him peeking through the window, it occurred to me that since the building does a U-turn, it would be a good idea to shoot him uh, walking on the back through those windows and then add the second shot and place it on top of the first one. So, uh, so to convey the idea that he goes around the building doing a tank compression and ellipsis and having him go around the building within one single image. This is a staircase and uh, then I found this window with a really nice texture on another floor and I used it to reframe the shot so that it will crop his head as he's going up the stairs. And this shot, I moved it to the left, and what you will see here is the city of Havana, but instead I shot a, an image of the nuclear power plant of Cienfuegos. This is a cloth filmed against a black screen, and then uh, using a Luma key filter, you can key out the cloth and add it here on the foreground on the left to create more tension as he's going inside. There's also a door with some nails here on the right that I added later. And the, there was a store next to the building, so I had to remove in this shot all the cars using Photoshop. Um, this is a hallway in the building. And then on another floor, I found this, which I liked, and also this little thing hanging here. So I used the two of them to reframe the shot and make it more look like a cave entrance. Most of the film is made with natural light. So here, without moving the camera, you take a second exposure and you can equal the luminosity outside and inside. And I removed the left uh, side of the building here as well. And in this shot, I really liked the house, but the building, the pink building behind it was terrible. So I had to remove it and add a view of the bay with the oil refinery. And in here, this is a very old technique, which is basically leaving the camera in the same position and placing the actor in two different positions. So mixing the two of them and dividing them on the center makes it seem like he's looking at himself. This shot was supposed to be a dean's office at the art schools and of course I wouldn't be able to film there because I didn't have a permit and I would never get it. So what I did is I shot the campus of the school and placed it on the window and found this interior with the same bricks that the school uses. In this shot uh, I basically remove, removed all the plants in the back because they were killing the atmosphere I wanted. So I took a shot of San Miguel del Padron which is an industrial area of the neighborhood with the chimney and the smoke. In this shot, I removed the green color of the grass and I added uh, a helicopter and a view of the bay on the back. Here, there were only two cups, but by placing them in different positions and doing a mask, it makes it seem like there's more of them. Same thing here, three cups and um, changed the color of the grass and added another cup here on the left and the helicopter on top. This is a shot taken from a balcony. And then I added uh, a shot of the boot here on the left. This shot had a lot of problems. Uh, as you can see, the color red, I didn't like the color red, so I had to remove it from both the bus and the clothing that the people were wearing. In this shot, uh, I had to place myself because I was acting in the scene, but it was very hard to take the shot and me acting, so I added myself later in, which is the hand here on the right, after the color correction. I had a screening at MoMA of one of my films, and after I finished the q and I told the audience, please don't move because I need to do a shot for the movie I'm working on because it was a free opportunity to have all these extras. In this shot, uh, this is the same technique. I used a double exposure without moving the camera so that we could see the outside and the train passing by. This is a film that is being shot without permits, uh, so I had to invest a lot of time in post-production to achieve what I want. This is, I needed a shot of a subjective point of view on the mirror, and of course, if you place the camera in front of the mirror, you see the camera, but then I did a second shot of her which would be the reflection, and then uh, did a mask on the mirror, an oval-shaped mask, and added her on the mirror, and also added some hair on the foreground to reinforce the subjective point of view. You know, you will find that the audiences at the Ashland Independent Film Festival are sophisticated audiences who will be uh, able to, I think, really appreciate uh, the incredible work you're doing. So we are so grateful. Thank you for spending this time in a talkback session. 
for our special Screening Cuba program. La calle 23, transformada hoy en Gran Boulevard de La Habana, muestra al mundo el gran atractivo de su belleza urbana a lo largo de sus cuatro kilómetros de extensión como vía principal que une dos municipios. Atenta al signo de los tiempos, la remozada 23 se inicia y termina con muestras evidentes de su preocupación por el automovilista, poniendo a su alcance los medios indispensables que faciliten el importantísimo servicio de revisar los autos que transiten por la amplia y moderna avenida. La zona de 23, denominada La Rampa, ha adquirido en corto tiempo justa fama e importancia comercial, donde se alinean modernamente instalados establecimientos de la más variada índole. Como toda arteria comercial importante, donde se desenvuelven negocios cuyo desarrollo se vincula con el extranjero, la necesidad de viajar se manifiesta continuamente ante el imperativo de hacer acto de presencia en determinados lugares del orbe, ya sea en viajes de negocios o de placer. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Ludmila Velasco. I born in Russia, Moscow, but I live in Cuba since I have uh, six, seven years. I am working as a visual arts art artist and photographer. Uh, my work, uh, I share with my work with Nelson Ramirez de Arellano Conde. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello to the audience of the Ashland Independent Film Festival. We're very happy to be here with you. And uh, well, yes, my name is Nelson Ramirez de Arellano, which is a very long name. And uh, I was also born outside of Cuba in, in Germany, in Berlin, in Germany. But, uh, but I'm Cuban, so they say we're both Cuban, but we're sort of uh, foreigners as well, somehow. Uh, and we love to share with you uh, a little bit with uh, our work, especially uh, Hotel Havana. Yeah, especially this uh, two channel installation, video installation, Hotel Havana. That is a work that we did uh, in, in 2008. And the idea was to, to show the differences between Havana in 1958 and Havana 50 years later, 2008. So we found this film entitled uh, 23rd Street, Havana's Broadway, and we filmed the same footage, the same uh, places, step by step, and we placed them uh, next to each other so people could see what happened 50 years later with the same places. Uh, our intention is to uh, create this kind of dimension of time, uh, recreating uh, different the moments uh, of the time, like a past and present and a future, um, trying to, to, to make some comparison, com compa comparing to, to past and the, and the present, the present and the idea of the future, try to, to, to make some approach to the um, uh, the subjectivity of the idea of the time. We found uh, fascinating to see how people in Cuba, I mean not only the Cubans, but people who come from abroad to visit Cuba, they're always talking about how was Cuba in the 50s uh, and, and comparing it with what Cuba is today and also talking about how would be Cuba in the future. And we found that so fascinating that we decided to, to work on that. And when we found this film, uh, actually by accident, we, we figured out it was a great opportunity to start talking about it. And, uh, and then we did this film and we started working also in, phot in photos, uh, finding images from the 50s and 40s that we could uh, re photograph the same places as the images you can see in the back. And, and then we add a few things we don't have, like what people have as expectations or 
fears about the future? Uh, the, the developing of the work is complex because we need to use um, some old images you can, we, we can find and create also at the same, ta at the same time uh, create these details uh, the, this advertising not commercial only uh, uh, but uh, also the um, preserve the revolution uh, propaganda and revolution advertising um, the, the the prints are big uh, because the because uh, 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 of the different details, so many yeah, you details. Have to see, uh, you have you to can print, see. You have this. to print them big so you can see yeah. many details on uh -huh. the images. And um, mm. well, uh, well, Cuba and, and the United States uh, have many, many links, uh, many, many connections. You know, over time. I mean, not only the brands uh, or or the character of the people. I mean sense of humor you know, we share many things actually people believe that uh, the ideas of capitalism enter into Cuba first and from Cuba they travel to Spain uh, in, in the uh, 18th century and, and, and 19th century you know so the the way that Cubans are uh, is sort of a mix in a way of how the Spaniards are and, and, and the Americans as well, there's a strong influence of, on that. And then you can see that on, on, on the images of, of the past. Uh, you can see a lot of advertisement uh, of American brands that were in Cuba. And well, suddenly in 1959, a year after this first film was made, uh, then everything changed and Cuba went into a different direction. What well, started as a as a revolution against the dictator, uh, it became sort of a cultural revolution as well. And, and Cuba started changing completely and going to a different idea. And the relationship with the government of the United States became very difficult. And it was a very, let's say, interesting process. Uh, I think for us, as artists, uh, it was very interesting to to capture these uh, subtle um, details, uh, presence of uh, another time of life, like in the 50 or, or even earlier, um, how all the, these different uh, moments of Cuban history converge in, in our timeline.